Hello everyone! I've been meaning to do this tier list for a while, but this is going to be something of a memory test for me as I haven't seen a lot of these shows in a long time, so there's a little bit of a landmine feel we're going to go through here, but I think my memory is good enough to pass judgment on quite a few of these characters. So, welcome to a tier list for human characters in Transformers. Now, there are hundreds of human characters throughout Transformers fiction, so we got to narrow it down a lot. So I got to keep it to just major characters who played major impacts or, or uh, with us for long enough of a time to have some character development. So there's some there's some like fluctuating criteria here in order to make this list. The major one is that it's only protagonists. There are no villain humans on this list. It's also limited to anyone who is in a cartoon or a movie. No one from the comic books, because that's where we get the hundreds from. And we're trying to also avoid iterations of the same character reinterpreted a dozen times. So, we're going to stick to what came down to a core set of about 38 that we're actually going to go through. And it starts where, of course, it has to start with Spike himself. Spike has a head on his shoulders, he's brave when he needs to be, but he also knows when he's in over his head against Decepticons. Uh, so he's not, you know, the clueless male character, and he's not, like, annoying or in the way like a human pro uh, ally or sidekick character can be. Uh, he comes in handy. He comes in handy. Like, I think he's still a pretty solid ally. We go up to the premium price. And yes, by the way, I'm still using this Holy Grail premium price, retail release bargain bin and flea market scale because, yes, it would make more sense to do it the other way. Yes, it would make more sense to do it the other way or use just like A, B, C. But at this point, this is the scale I always use. So this is my gimmick, whether we're talking about retail products or not. Just get used to it. It's my grading scale. So, if Spike is premium price point, where does Spark Plug go? It's always weird when a human character knows how to repair a Transformer, and a living alien robot, but it always does feel necessary because it helps get us a little bit more in touch with like how a Transformer is built, but it also helps explain how they repair themselves with parts, components, materials that they're not entirely familiar with. So, there is always a place for it, even if it seems a little bit far-fetched. There are better ones out there. Uh, Storyline-wise, Sparkplug, he, he really only made an impact in Season 1, faded out in Season 2, completely gone in Season 3. But we're going to put him there because he, he isn't annoying, he isn't frustrating, he has his purposes. Chip Chase, I actually have always really liked Chip Chase. So, aside from just, he's got the brilliance for Earth Smarts that the Autobots lack, uh, but he also seems to come in handy a lot, you know, as he has that computer knowledge that all the other humans lack, and even sometimes has more ingenuitive ideas than the Autobots do. I also feel like being wheelchair-bound kind of in a weird way puts him alongside the Autobots since, you know, it is a life on wheels kind of thing. But they never highlight it, point it out. Even the Decepticons don't treat him any differently because he's in a wheelchair. Uh, it's kind of how to do a character like that properly where you're not highlighting it, you're not making it like, oh, he lost his wheelchair in this episode, how is he going to get by? You're not doing anything like that. Chip comes across really useful, really smart, and I actually really, really like the character. Carly makes just enough appearances because she also lasts all the way to season three, becoming, you know, Spike's wife. She's brilliant. She is approaching Chip Chase in intelligence. And it kind of sets up a trope that does kind of run... It's the classic trope of, like, the love interest who's smarter than the guy. Uh, like, the female being smarter than the guy. Whether you go all the way back to, like, black and white sitcoms like Honeymooners. You go to, like, The Simpsons. You go to, like, more, you know, newer sitcoms. Uh, name, like, I guess name a sitcom with a male comedian at the lead. It pretty much is just the thing to do. So... Uh, Carly doesn't leave much of an impact, though, and doesn't really have growth, so I can't really put her high. But she's in there long enough that I think she warrants being on the list. Uh, so, 
after that, none of the, none of the humans in G1 really leave an impact uh, enough for this list. Fairborn is like the only one close, but she doesn't make enough appearances really. So we're going to go with that. We're going to move on to the Unicron trilogy where human partners and human, you know, pro tags became a very common thing. So, all right. So, um, bud, uh, rad apologies. I jumped ahead. Uh, rad who wants to tell you about transformers. This is where we start getting into like a middle ground. Uh, rad doesn't really have that much, particularly special about him he's just kind of like middle ground leveled out so like definitely under carly because he doesn't come in handy he's really just there because he's bonded to one of the mini cons and really a lot of the human element in armada is just tag along there's very little to do with actually contributing or having a character arc themselves the same would go for uh Sorry, uh, this would go with Carlos as well. The problem with Carlos is, I don't know, it's... There's a lot of pushing, there's a lot of pushing, like, uh, Hispanic cliches onto Carlos. Uh, that kind of became a character trope of his. It's not a comfortable trope either. There's really not a lot of characterization to him outside of, you know, it's the kind of thing, where it's not like, naturally incorporated like this is just like how like someone like him would act and reference so this is like like hey remember i'm hispanic it's it's that kind of characterization which is not good not good alexis comes off a lot better though she actually does incorporate herself into the bigger picture she actually does have things that she accomplishes no namely her connection to starscream and how that affected his character growth and change showing genuine friendship with a human was a huge thing for him and while he was okay with all the humans it was alexis that he was really kind of uh finding a bond with and she him as well and you know it's a big it's a big thing for a character like that to start trusting a former enemy it it shows some trust and like it's heartbreaking when she finds out starscream dies so she makes it higher than the others she's still it's still because it's armada and the kids don't really do a whole lot storyline wise she can't be too high but she's definitely deserves to be higher than the others and i definitely like her a lot better than the others all right, so uh, uh, Bulk and Skull. I, I mean, uh, Fred and Billy. Uh, yeah, they're the bullies, and then they start becoming tagalongs, and then provide zero to the series. They should have just been left on Earth and just left as bullies who got their comeuppance at the end of the show. Uh, it does not help that Fred is voiced by the guy who did Ed in Ed, Ed, and Eddie without changing his delivery, his inflection, his anything. It just sounds like Ed. <laughs> like a really whiny version of Ed, which is not good. It's not good. Oh, speaking of not good, we get to talk about Kicker now. Whew. All right, so I can't entirely hate on Kicker because I've met the voice actor, Brad Swell, and he does, he like, he's super cool. Like, Super cool guy. And, like, he knows a lot of people don't like Kicker. And he doesn't care because he's just super happy to be in Transformers. Like, he legitimately loved being a Transformer character, even if it's one nobody liked. So, I give Kicker more credit than that. But Kicker is... He's Mary Sue in the new definition of Mary Sue. He's a kind of a forced-in character who was given, like, the ability to... Like, given, like, crazy ability. In order to be like, you know, like more useful in the grand scheme of the storyline, but he just comes off across there trying too hard to make him cool, too hard to incorporate him into the larger Autobot picture. He get, he flies around on the Minicon sword. He he wields an Energon sword himself. Uh, he he can actively like fight Transformers from time to time, um, and he's just whiny. He's just whiny, just so whiny the whole time. Like, he's a annoying character. Just annoying. Uh, Misha's not too bad. She's, again, just kind of, like, flat level. Again, 
She's a genius girl with an idiot boyfriend. That's a running trope. And it's not the last one we're going to see. All right, so she's fine. She's fine. She doesn't leave too much of an impact. She has one episode that's really to her credit when she uh, she beats, uh, where she like she wins the race in, in like the black suit while she's racing on RC, just to kind of show the boys. You know, she had one of those kind of episodes. I like her, but she but I have to put her low because she just doesn't do much in the show. She's around the whole time, but doesn't really get there. Now let's talk about Bud. Because Bud actually does what Kicker failed to do. He actually does earn a place beside the Autobots. The problem is, he does it the correct way, whereas Kicker just got it all handed to him before the show. Superpower gift from Primus that never really explained why this random human got this ability. Why did Primus bless you of all people? But Bud, he was the mechanical genius for Cybertron. Uh partnered with uh, Landmine for a while, like bonded to Landmine, which the, the gruff veteran type is never the one you get bonded to. It's always the young Autobot. It's always the Bumblebee or the Hotshot. Nope. You actually get the gruff one, and it's a, it's kind of a nice change of pace. But what's cool about him is the fact that he he continues to like prove himself with his mechanical ability, and then eventually grows to the point where he can re- uh, remodel one of the the uh, the scrap metals in order to become a mech suit for himself. And while it is not used that much, it does actually let him stand with the Autobots the way Kicker did, but it took him almost the whole series to get there. He actually legitimately earned that distinction. So across the Armada, Armada Energon, Cybertron, the Unicron trilogy... He's definitely the highest I would put. Like, he definitely feels worthy of being way up there. Uh, oh, I mean, I'm still, I'm still misnaming him, by the way. It's, 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 Co it's, ugh. I hate when I do that. It's Kobe. Why did I get his name wrong the whole time? Why didn't you, why didn't any of you warn me I was getting the name wrong the whole time? I told you this would be a memory test. All right, Bud himself. I feel like there's no point to Bud being there other than to recreate the three kids with three mini cons pattern from Armada. Um, I really do not find anything particularly special about his character. I don't really find that he really needs to be around. He's not offensive. He's just superfluous. He's the appendix of the series. And then there is Lori. Lori, ha Lori is like hothead anime girl trope. Um, I know there's a name for that trope, but I'm not going to bother looking up uh, TV tropes to find it right off the bat right now. She is that typical, like, very quick to anger anime girl to the point where she is, like, intimidating other Transformers, where she can boss around Scourge. But that said, like, the fact that she has a personality that can not only intimidate the likes of you know like the full-size transformers uh and like in like bossed around like wing saber for instance but also like a kind of ferociousness and a determination to her personality that can impress scourge all right all right so she does better she does better and then yeah her and Kobe get have this like little like yeah they're eventually gonna get together thing which is nice thing and I like that they put the wedding at the end just so you know hey we got we went full circle with it all right controversial entry time because yes um we know okay animate has been out for a long time this isn't even like uh like a final episode spoiler or anything I think it's okay at this point to mention that sorry Sumdak is not technically human she's Cybertronian with an with a human alt mode, essentially. So I'm putting her in here because, yes, technically she's an Autobot, but she is also in the role of the human sidekick protagonist. But the thing is, in that role, she is competent. She is fun to watch. She has legitimate bonds to all the Autobots, not just her favorite. And, yeah, she legitimately is just like, 
one of the best, if not the best, you know, when she gets her evolution and becomes like the teenager and she knows her origins, she only gets better and more useful to the series. And to see that growth in the character is a really cool thing. And we don't really, it's rare when we get to see human characters grow in Transformers, even if they're technically not human, but she fills the role. So we're putting her very top. I don't think I can put her anywhere else really. All right, Isaac Sumdak. Again, another fun character. He was interesting because in the first season, he's getting played by Megatron the whole time. You know, everything he invented is reversed engineered from Megatron. And it's all... He's all he's just getting suckered into it the whole time. So he's, been, he's also trying to kind of like make up for that mistake as the series goes on and just trying to be a good dad to uh sorry include you know because he knows the whole time what she really is so he's trying his best amongst a lot of chaos so again well-written character uh, there's some nuance to him too we're gonna put him pretty high i don't think holy grail level but we're gonna put him up there fan zone this is why i hate machines again animated just had so many good characters animated was so good at characters wasn't it so he he was that he was that human he was like human like who kept interacting with the Transformers even though it took him a while to actually come around to them, uh, and yeah like he's kind of a running gag of a character but he's also a necessary character because you know, the Autobots are supposedly heroes in this series, uh, so if you're gonna portray them as heroes you need someone on the police side of things to kind of temper them a little bit, that's what Fanzone provides and he's pretty good at it. Now, does he have, like, a lot of character growth? No. Is he that much of an essential to the series? No. I'm still going to put him relatively high, but I'm not going to put him above characters like Alexis, who had, like, major, you know, character shifts or were responsible for character shifts. But he does definitely need to be up there. Let's get into the Prime cast now with Jack. And Jack is another one of those kind of middle-of-the-road characters... You know, he's kind of like Spike in that, you know, he is a good resource for the Transformers, for humanity. Um, he knows when to stay out of a situation. He's the level-headed one of that team of humans, which is very necessary. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about why next. Jack himself, I think, is okay. Um, I don't really... He doesn't really... He doesn't have a whole lot to him outside of his relationship with RC. And I feel like the internet ruined that. <sighs> All right. So I'm going to put him top of the retail release, if only because he didn't, he didn't really do as much as I had hoped he would, considering he's supposed to be like the main human amongst the cast. Like most of his drama mostly came from uh, having to deal with his mom, who eventually learned what was going on. All right, this is going to be problematic. This is going to be problematic. So Miko annoyed a lot of people because Miko was the one who was way too brave and naive for her own good, charging headfirst into problems, uh, trying to be front line with the Autobots, even though she was way over her head. But this would put her very low. A lot of the fandom really doesn't like her. The more I think back to her, the more I kind of think to myself, that would be me. <laughs> I would be super geeking out if giant alien robots were a real thing and I was actually friends with them. I would want to go on their adventures. I would want to be bullheaded like this. I would want to be in the mix. Oh my, I like Miko. I like Miko a lot more than most. I think she's... I think there's a lot to her that people don't want to admit they would be like that, but they would be like that. Yeah. So for that, I'm not, I'll, I'll, I will give you this. She could be, you know, here's the thing. Here's the thing. She has growth. She has character growth. She has more character growth than Jack does because she does eventually earn that spot. She earns her spot in the wreckers. She earns the respect from the Autobots as a fighter rather than just a human contact. I'm going to put her higher than Jack 
You're not going to agree with me, but it's my list. Wrath. I never understood Wrath. His whole thing was he's super genius, so you've got to have that in the in the series somewhere. But he's also like he's capable of understanding Bumblebee's blips and buzzes, and they never explain how he just automatically knows that language. It should be something like weirdly connected to him. Like he should be connected to like the whole why transformer stuff is so like common to find on earth trope he should he should be connected to that but he's not he's just a super brilliant kid that knows how bumblebee speaks it's weird and he, again he never really does that much a few inventions here or there but he really doesn't play a major part you know it's I don't know. He kind of he kind of feels again like he's just not doing enough, or that like what he was supposed to do wasn't really well developed. How about Agent Fowler? This is the human contact with the government with the like Earth officials done correctly because he's not overseeing them out of distrust or anything. He's monitoring them. He's reporting about them. He's occasionally intervening when you know the situation calls for it. Or he thinks the humans are better suited to handle this mess than, you know, the giant alien robot. But as he comes to trust them more, as he comes to trust the other humans more, gets a little bit too close to Jack's mom, um, he's fine. He's fine. He comes across pretty well. Um, I'm not going to put in, like, I think, I think I actually like him character-wise better than I do Jack. Honestly. You know, because I, I think he, I think he develops more than Jack does. All right, so now we're going to get into just the last two humans on this list because it's been a while since we've actually had, you know, human characters in Transformers uh, animation. So Russell and Denny, we'll, get, we'll cover both at the same time. So Russell and his dad, Den you know, uh, well, uh, I don't even remember if I'm getting that right. <laughs> okay, Denny's the dad, Russell's the dad. You can see how much of an impression these two left on me. Uh, again, middle of the road contact. I think, I think Denny's a little bit better because he's again he's got that mechanical know-how, and he's the one providing most of the good cover stories for the giant robots in his scrapyard. But neither one of them really impressed me as characters. Neither one really do. So I'm, I'm yeah, they're going middle. They're not offensive. They're not offensive. But. You know, they just do not, they don't do enough. Like, they don't, they're the main, they're the main human characters, but they just don't do enough, really. All right, so we're done with the animation. Let's talk live action. All right, buckle up. <laughs> get ready to fill up the bargain bin. We, we acknowledge, before we get into this, we acknowledge the Transformer live action movies are generally terrible at conveying character. You know, they boil Transformers down to accents and one-beat character notes. The human cast is boiled down to running and screaming and super annoying comic relief. And, and, and eye candy, I guess. So it's not great. It's kind of weird. Uh, so we're going to get through these quicker because uh, a lot of these just are meh. Sam himself. All right, so... How do we grade Shia LaBeouf amongst all of this? I think Sam, as a kid, in over his head in the first movie is fine, and he's got courage enough to actually handle Megatron when the time comes. After that, he just kind of gets deus exed into every situation. You know, and he doesn't really seem to change much after that. I feel like once he got Michaela... He basically stopped as a character. And whatever reason why, like, the Primes chose him, you know, in Revenge of the Fallen, and like, no, you can't die. You're too important. Why? <laughs> we don't know. All we know is that saving the world and having, a, you know, like, you know, like, like a Congressional Medal of Honor didn't get him a job in the next movie. So, that's about, yeah, yeah, um... Sam is like middle of retail release. He's just, he's not great. He's not, he's not great, you know. Michaela is eye candy. 
They they threw this thing in where like she may have a sketchy past, and basically that's it. At that point, she's just a girl too pretty to be eating at Burger King. Um, I just I don't like. It has nothing to do with the Megan Fox aspect of it. I just never liked Michaela. I just never did. I never believed her as like a love interest for Sam, and I never felt like she contributed anything it's just a, you know she's just a nice thing to look at and like michael bay really liked having nice things to look at in his human cast simmons on the other hand is never fails to be entertaining like he's probably gonna i'll probably do this i would be surprised if anyone else in the live action cast went higher than him so i'm already i'm just gonna go ahead and put him up to the premium price point uh he's great like he's you know, whether it's just being this super paranoid, semi-creepy agent in the first movie to, like, the way he pops up in subsequent movies, it's always amusing. And you can always tell he's having fun portraying this character. So, credit where credit's due. Simmons is best. Simmons is great. Uh, Epps is there to lead the charge in a fight scene where Lennox is not, when, when Lennox isn't around. I feel like he is the Robin to Lennox's Batman. That's giving Lennox way too much credit, by the way. Uh, again, he gets by on the fact that he's Tyrese, who in real life is a big Transformers fan. But the character himself, when the character's greatest contribution to Transformers as a whole is left cheek, left cheek, left cheek, I can't put you very high on this list. I just can't I'll put you at top of bargain bin because you're Tyrese. How about that? All right. Uh, where does Lennox end up? I will give him credit. I'll give him credit for longevity. Like he appeared in quite a few of the live action movies. Um, but he comes across better than Epps, but he's still not doing a whole lot outside of like the last scene of the first movie where like he's reconnecting to his family. We never really touch on any kind of story for him ever again at that point. He's just kind of there at that point because he's dealt with Decepticons longer than any other humans. And when he pops back up in the last night, he's kind of helping a negotiation with Megatron, which is not great. It's not a good look for him. And when... <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'll put him higher. I'll put him higher. He's sorry. Right. right, yeah. So I'll put him up higher. No, no. I like him better. I like him better than Sam. I like him better than Sam. We'll give him that. Uh, Leo. I forgot Leo was in the movie. Bottom of the bottom there in the flea market. He he exists as dumb comic relief. You're supposed to laugh at him because he's like conspiracy nut that collects kitten calendars and his pants fell down. Laugh at Leo. That's all he's there for. Like, before I put this list together, I totally forgot he existed. But he's, like, he's with them for the rest of the movie, so I, I, I have to include it. So, there you go. Leo sucks. Uh, live action Carly. It's at this point, I'll remind you, that the original G1 cast of names in humans kind of follows the same trend as Transformer names. Sparkplug, Spike, Chip, they're all just kind of like simple things. They are names that mean other things. So at this point, I'll point out that Carly was a pun on car. Spike was dating car. Make of that what you will. In live action, hey, guess what? She is the smart one of the pair again. She is very intelligent. And beyond that, she, her, her personality is intelligent and very rich. That's all her personality is. Outside of, like, one scene where she kind of gets the browbeat Megatron into, like, what happened to you, man? Like, that's amusing. But I don't think it's enough to really warrant her going that high on the list. Um, she's there to replace Megan Fox. And when you're Megan Fox's stand-in, that doesn't say a lot. That really doesn't say a lot. All right. Cade Yeager. The most action name I've heard since the 90s. Cade Yeager. All right. As a human pro tag, I genuinely like him better. Um, I feel like, okay, again, we're dealing with the old mechanic thing, right? We're dealing with like, the inventor, like good engineer type, which is like something that lets them connect to Transformers a little bit better. But I also feel like he's got more action chops than Shia LaBeouf. Uh, he's not running and screaming the whole time, which is good. 
you know, he grabs an alien gun. Once he's got an alien gun, he goes to town, you know, and he actually stands his ground. So good, good. Like he actually, I believe him better as an action hero than I do Shia LaBeouf. So give Marky Mark that much credit. Um, Where do I put him? Where do I put him? Um, Definitely above Sam. Do I like him better than Lennox? Um, I like some of his story beats, like like that kind of like struggling father thing a little bit better. So yeah, I'll put him a little bit above. I uh, still like the rest above him better though. Um, now I get into the rough stuff. Um, so Tessa, Tessa never liked. I, I she's there to give Cade something to dote over. It's like she exists basically for his characterization, not her own. She just kind of is like just trying to prove that she can be a, a grown up and an independent. Uh, yeah, she's not a good character. Oh, here's Shane. Absolute worst. Bottom of the bin. Bottom of the bin. If you forget Shane, Shane is the one they tried to make super cool because he's such a good driver. He could ramp a car off of a dirt mound and use the rear tire to basically kick somebody in the head without, you know, ripping their face off, decapitating them, cracking and separating their spinal column, you know, without murdering somebody. So they tried to make him super cool. And then he, they made him incredibly creepy. This is a guy who carries around a card in his pocket to explain why it's legal for him to date an underage girl. Why, why? Who in the right mind? Who in the right mind making this movie? Who would Paramount wrote that off? Where, did, like... How much cocaine did Michael Bay snort that day to actually go, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> that won't, won't backfire at all. I hate Shane. I hate Shane. I hate the person that wrote him. I hate the person who directed him. I hate everything about him, and I hate that they ever put him in the movie. It's super creepy. I basically put him in this list just so I could shame him and shame everyone who is involved in him. The only one I don't blame is the actor who just wanted to be in a big blockbuster. All right. Uh, Cade's love interest, Vivian, uh, who I couldn't even be bothered to remember the name of. I had to go to it. Um, her and Kate again, she's the smart one of the two. Remember? <laughs> the girl is the smart one. The guy is the dumb lummox. All right. Bargain bin two. Oh, no, 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 no. Tessa's worse. Uh, she's at least, you know, like, Vivian's at least smart, but she has no chemistry with Cade whatsoever. At no point did I look at those two and go, eh, yeah, they should be together by the end of the movie. Forced. Forced. Um, Isabel. Hey, look. A human child in a Transformers live-action movie. That only took five movies to figure out that humans need kid connections because it's a toy line. So, um, but yeah, she doesn't really accomplish much. Again, she's... She's the precocious youth, which is a little bit charming, but, you know, she's still just not really effective in any way, shape, or form, and she's partnered with, uh, she's, she's partnered with, oh God, I can't even remember, I can't even remember the stupid thing's name, Squeaks, who is also incredibly forgettable. Yeah, so, live-action characters not faring well here, right? Right? All right. So, uh, Sir Edmund Burton. I put respect on that name. Anthony Hopkins knew he was in a turd of a movie, but hey, it's a big blockbuster. He's getting paid good, so he's going to have fun while he does it. And you could tell he was just... He was just in it for the meme. He was just in it for fun. But it made him fun. And, like He actually had like a bond with Cogman that was actually kind of nice to see. So he goes high. Again, like him better than Sam. Do I like him better than uh, Lennox? I think I do. I think I do. I think he is at least fun to watch. Not Simmons-level fun, because, you know, he's only in one movie. But, you know, it's Anthony Hopkins basically just enjoying himself. So that works. Charlie, in two hours of watching the Bumblebee movie, I believed Charlie's connection to Bumblebee more than I believe Sam's connection to Bumblebee across three movies. You know? You know, Bumble like Sam felt like he loved Bumblebee the way you would love your actual car. I love my Mini Cooper. 
but I wouldn't call it my best friend, and if it transformed and came to life, I'd probably treat it a little bit better than forcing it to live in vehicle mode in my garage. You know? Uh, but Charlie and Bumblebee just seem to have a much more natural connection. Charlie herself goes through a personal growth that has nothing to do with a love interest. Like, even, like, they even went to that point. It's like, no, 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 with, with, uh, Memo. And he's like, you know, no, we're not there yet. Which is a, it's a refreshing take. So, she goes high. She goes high. So, is she as entertaining as Simmons? No. But she's more natural. As a human protag, I, I connect to her far stronger. And I think she's a far better written character. Memo... Memo's a little bit of comic relief. Memo is there, so she has somebody to talk to that doesn't speak through radio. Um, doesn't accomplish a whole lot, but he's not irritating either. And I think he makes a pretty good foil for Charlie at the right times. So, she's not going to go too high. He's not going to go too high, but he's not bad. I think the weirdest thing about him is the name Memo, which, granted, I remember it. And last but not least, Agent Burns. So, he starts as antagonistic. I put him in this list because he does have a character arc and growth himself. He does turn. Through the movie, he has a legitimate reason. Like, he has a reason to believe Bumblebee was responsible for his men dying. Uh, but uh, throughout the movie, he does come to learn that there's a difference between an Autobot and a Decepticon. He knows that the ones that the humans have found and partnered with aren't to be trusted. You know, he's the... It took, what, 35 years? How long? Like, it did take like 35 years or so for some human in Transformers fiction to actually go... They call themselves Decepticons. That doesn't tell you something? That alone... That alone is great. But he has the character art where he learns who Bumblebee really is. And by the end of the movie, is helping is helping him get away. And, you know, it shows respect to Bumblebee. You know, so I like that he had that character growth. I like that he had the character turn. So let's see. Where do we go? Where do we go? Um, I think I like him better than Lennox. I like him better than Lennox. Whew! All right, so I'm going to leave that at that. I'm surprised, like, I don't really have much room in my holy grail for the human cast of characters. It's very rare when one really connects to me. That's not to mean there are bad ones, but I feel like a lot just kind of plays second fiddle to the Autobots. You know, they're there for the major characters to have people to speak to, to explain human things, or to have a human perspective on things so the Transformers can explain things to us, the audience. So, it's not too many that are seriously impactful or really connect to me. But the ones that do are really, really strong in that. So, I'm going to leave it at that. Because this list is already like 40 minutes long. And I will let you debate in the comments below how wrong I am. Who I forgot, because I'm sure I did someone. And at some point, yes, uh, we got to do something for the villains. Because, as everyone pointed out, I forgot Silas the last time I spoke humans. And, uh... That's going to be a different format, I think, because there's not as many villainous humans as there are heroic. And I don't know comic books well enough to go there, so we're going to leave that as it is. So, there is my list for now. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you agree with at least a few of these. I know none of you are agreeing with Miko. I know it already, so go ahead and let me know in the comments, and I will see you next time. Guys, I am facing the most powerful enemy any YouTuber can face, the algorithm, and I need your help to defeat him. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and leave a comment. Every time you do, we attack that algorithm and we drive it back until it can no longer defeat this channel. Thank you very much.